All right, I am going to go ahead and get started and say hello, everyone, and welcome to our March edition of the Savory Session. We are excited today to bring Jennifer Bartlett from the SciX program, not to be confused with SciAct program, two different things, but both still important in the NASA community. Um, as always, before we really jump into things, let me introduce myself. My name is Jessica Swan. I am your community manager for the SCOPE project. And here with me on the line is Anna Aranda, who is just amazing in all things that she does. So you typically get a lot of communications from her. So this is the, this is the young lady who has been sharing all about SCOPE with you. All right, so just a quick reminder about what is SCOPE. So we are in fact a community of practice. Uh, communities, of practice communities of practice are defined by the community, by the domain that they work in and what is their practice. So our community is you, subject matter experts and early career scientists and NASA science activation teams. <laughs> Excuse me. Our domain is the Earth and Space Sciences and Engineering Education. Our goal is to broaden participation of NASA science to engage learners of all ages. And our practice together is to create inspiring educational materials and experiences that are both effective and true to the science, but also most importantly, inclusive for all audiences. Um, our uh, type of community of practice. There are four types of community of practice. We consider ourselves a best practice community and a knowledge stewarding community. So if you've never heard that before, this is what we're all about. And, you know, I always like to start every savory session with one of our savory snacks. So today's savory snack comes from Jamaica. It is the cocoa bread. So cocoa bread is popular, a popular staple in Jamaica and other parts of the Caribbean. It's buttery, slightly sweet, with a spot of firmness on the outside and softness on the inside. It's great for breakfast, lunch, snacking, or even dinner. So my question for you, and you can pop your answer into chat, which of these is typically not included in the recipe to make cocoa bread? So if you've ever made cocoa bread before, which of these is not included in the recipe? Anyone? Any guesses out there? I got milk from Valerie. <clears throat> Excuse me. Flour from Laura. Any other fun guesses? The big reveal in three, two, one. The answer is milk. Kind of a trick question because it's actually cocoa milk that is used. Coconut milk is used to create this savory snack. Uh, anyway, so now you know a little bit about Jamaica and the cocoa bread. All right, well, without further ado, I would like to take an opportunity to introduce you to uh, Dr. Jennifer Bartlett. She is the project scientist for astrophysics at the Center for Astrophysics. Whoops, let me go to the next screen so you can see more about her. Um, uh, the Center for Astrophysics, which is a collaboration between Harvard and the Smithsonian. She's got over 10 years of work experience in government and industry, including flying satellites and building steering controls for Navy destroyers. What? Her current research involves understanding how light passes through our atmosphere. And she's here to share with you some opportunities through the SciX program. And with that, Jennifer, I'd love to hand it off to you. Okay, thank you. Next slide. I am delighted to be here to talk to y'all about the NASA Science Explorer or SciX which is a new multidisciplinary digital library based on the successful model of the astrophysics data system, which has been serving astronomy and astrophysics for about 30 years. I'm the project scientist for astrophysics on SciX. My partner, Stephanie Jarmack, is the project scientist for planetary science. And she regrets that she's unable to be here with us today due to a scheduling conflict. Next slide.
SciX is an open literature-based digital information system. It supports planetary science, astrophysics, heliophysics, earth science, NASA-funded research within the biological and physical sciences. It is intended to provide transparency into how scientific data are collected and used to encourage the reuse of software, data, and methodologies across multiple disciplines. We launched this free database in December 2023 at the American Geophysical Union meeting. Next slide, please. For each discipline, research output, usually in the form of publications, is aggregated, connected, indexed. We start with the core journals for a discipline, and we take all of those articles. Then we look at what do those papers reference? If they're not part of the system, we pull them in. What papers cite the papers in our core system? If they're not part of the index, then we pull those in. Then we look at the citations and references for the papers that we pulled in, and we pull those in, working outward to produce a network of citations and references that take us to the non-refereed literature and the lesser known sources. Next slide, please. Also for each discipline, we are building a customized user interface, a suite of search and analysis tools that are specific to each discipline. That way you can look for papers, even papers in a different discipline using language and terms and acronyms that are familiar to you. But regardless of what interface you choose, you still search the entire multidisciplinary database, all of the papers. Next slide, please. With NASA SciX, you can search the scientific literature, current and historic, by topic, by object, by author name, by ORCID, by an organization that's in involved with the research, either as the affiliation of an author or a funder or someone else contributing to that work. You can build very broad queries or you can build very specific queries using the fields and operators that we provide. But we also give you a set of built-in functions that make it very easy to ask for papers that are similar to the one that I'm reading papers that are trending among a certain group of people, papers that are useful to someone working in a, in a particular area, or papers that give an overview of a topic. Next slide, please. Once you have found a paper that is interesting to you, then that is also a jumping off point for even more exploration. You could read the open access versions. We link to all the versions we can find. So that includes the publisher's version of record, but also any open access version, any preprint vision, and consolidate that all down into a single record. You can look at the references that the authors themselves cited. You can see who cited that paper. You can find similar papers. You can go out to the repository and try out the software. You can look at the data sets and see whether they would be useful to you. And you can also look at the metrics that analyze how this paper is being cited or read and have an idea of what influence it is having in your area of research. Next slide, please. SciX also provides a series of visualizations, another way of thinking about the connections between people and collaborations between topics and metrics. For instance, these two graphs show the collaborations, the groups of people working on a specific topic, as well as in the second one, the connections between authors in different collaborations. So seeing how the whole ecosystem of scientific research on a particular topic Next slide, please. 
You can use NASA SciEx to share your research by creating a personal library. Libraries within NASA SciEx are essentially customized bibliographies. They can be personal and private, or they can be public. So you might build a public library that showcases all of the papers that you have written or contributed to. Alternatively, you could create a small library that's just shared among your collaborators that has the papers for a paper that you're writing, so your reference list. Or you could create an entirely private library that is basically your reading list for some things that you might be interested in and might want to look into later. Next slide, please. You could also use a combination of libraries and visualizations to share your research in a public outreach concept context. For instance, this word cloud of terms from Bob Paparaldo's papers showcases his work on the Europa Clipper mission in a way that might be more accessible to the public than trying to read the technical papers. Next slide, please. Also, you might consider becoming an ambassador for NASA SciEx. Ambassadors will talk to their community about SciEx and how to get the most from the system, go to meetings and present. Also, the communication back to the development team, what are we doing well, what needs to be tweaked, what great service or idea has someone in the field had they would like to see come to fruition. And NASA SciEx ambassadors will be invited to showcase their research on our website and through our blogs. Next slide, please. If you think you might be interested in the ambassador program, please apply soon. Applications are due next Thursday, April 4th, and we will be selecting the inaugural class in mid-April. This first group will play a leading role in shaping the overall program. So working out how these things do, what benefits the ambassador and what benefits SciEx. The goal is to educate each research community about the power of SciEx and the connections that can be made through this system, but also to ensure that SciEx is responsive to each of these communities. No one of us can represent even our full discipline entirely. So that's why we need you to connect us with your networks to build a truly interdisciplinary community. Next slide, please. The power of SciEx is that it is developed by scientists for scientists. And as we the project scientists, again, cannot represent our even our full discipline, let alone all of the quite broad research that NASA does in so many areas and outside of NASA on topics, these broad topics. So tell us, how do scientists in your field talk about their research? Help us test services that we are developing. What's intuitive? What works well? What are aggravating or not clear? How can we improve and what can we do to assist you that we don't already provide? The network of links to other resources, not just papers, but data and notebooks and software are critical to the system. That is part of the strength of it is once you get to one resource, you can move to multiple other resources. Are the data and software repositories that you use adequately represented in SciEx? Do they papers link to resources at the appropriate level? Are there things that we are missing that we should be including? And we also ask that you connect us to your community. Perhaps we could provide a tailored presentation of some sort, presentation, newsletter, other kinds of information that would be directly helpful for the problems that you are working on. Again, I encourage you to apply for the Lead Ambassador Program, or if it seems like more work than you want to commit to, we're also envisioning a broader, less intense experience as well later this year. Next slide, please. 
Most of all, we look forward to working with you, to building the tools to facilitate 21st century interdisciplinary science. Please reach out to us at the email addresses on the slide. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We sincerely appreciate it. So we're gonna go ahead and open up the floor for questions. So you can either type them in the chat or you can go live on your mic. While we're waiting for the first question, I have a question for you, Jennifer. Um, so in the in the database, is it just uh, pure science or does it also include scientific education? So things like what maybe science activation is doing? Yes. So we we cover um, public outreach communications. Many of those come in not as necessarily as the refereed literature, but mm -hmm. as as the gray literature. So conference proceedings and things things like that. Oh, if you're finding that you're publishing your work or producing it in a way that is not represented, then please talk to us and we can figure out how to make the connections to that. My experience is in, in the astronomy and astrophysics. I started in 2009 with my team at the Naval Observatory where I was previously producing a series of papers about solar eclipse public outreach. Mm -hmm. So it's in there as when will it be preparing for 20, 2017, then 2023, then 2024. All right. So I see questions are starting to roll into chat. So the first one is, do you have an estimated time commitment, time commitment for being an ambassador? So approximately how many hours a week? We're looking for a couple hours a month. No, oh. not. <laughs> So there would be the expectation that you do two presentations. There, there is some funding for you to come to a two-day meeting and learn about SciEx on our site, and then funding for you to attend a conference where you would present about your own research and to present about SciEx. Obviously, the time that you're preparing those will be higher demand. In other months, probably a simply an hour call to check in and talk to other members about what's happening, what's working for them, what's not. And we would understand if you couldn't make all of those, but there'd be an expectation that you would attend at least quarterly one of those. Okay. And then the next question is, are there tutorials for how to use SciEx or are those something that's planned to be created? That is in the works. The... We were just debating <laughs> in my previous meeting, the sound quality of the recordings I had done. So we are actively working on those and hope to build up a set that is both video and written. Great. Uh, and tips. something that we would ask the ambassadors to help us with. <laughs> okay, Small sorry. We've been recently using um, AI to create the audio for our tutorial videos, so. If the audio okay. is a sticking point, there are things out there that you can use. Um, okay, next question is eligibility requirements. So what are the eligibility requirements? Do I need to be a US citizen? Do I need to be a PhD candidate, et cetera? We, it is not limited to US citizens. We cover science, not just NASA produced science, but all science within those disciplines that are covered by the science mission directorates. And that is produced by people who are US citizens and by people who are not. So there is not a requirement for US citizenship. We are looking primarily for people who are early career, just past the PhD. This may be more than you want to take on while you are trying to finish your, your graduate work. Great. Valerie. Because we want you to finish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're muted, Valerie. I apologize. <laughs> I am currently working with a small cohort of um, HBCUs in terms of the eclipse. And one of the um, 
kind of the issues or ideas that have come up is really getting some of this information before them as a body. Some of the challenges, they have really high teaching loads, especially if they're just coming into um, some of these institutions. So um, two things, is there a way to have, you said that you could have a conversation or maybe present this material. So would we just directly contact you to maybe have a small cohort meet via Zoom um, with you all yes. to explain more? And second, if they miss the April 4th deadline, um, will there be another round um, in a year's time or? Yes, we are We're anticipating that we will be advertising for a new lead, lead cohort which is the higher time commitment. But again, we're still talking about a few hours a month mm -hmm. so that this is accessible to early career professionals who are <laughs> not maybe as overwhelmed as you were as a graduate student, but still trying to balance um, teaching and research and service and needing those credentials. With So we expect that we will call for that around this time next year. We also anticipate a little bit more low key level of participation later this year, but we're figuring out what that might look like as we develop the, the more intense ambassadors program or lead ambassadors program. Also, we have a program that is just starting with an educational consultant on outreach to um, HBCUs specifically and how we can make the tools and resources more accessible and the science more accessible. And also oh. looking at serving four-year and undergraduate institutions as well as the, the more research-oriented universities. Great, I'd love to talk with that person. Um, so that sounds wonderful, thank you. Drop me a line and I'll put you in touch with her. Okay, will do. All righty, any other questions out there? All right, so I assume if you guys, if anyone here has uh, additional questions, feel free to reach out directly to Jennifer or to Stephanie with those questions. Otherwise, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing about the SciX op Sci opportunity with our community of subject matter experts here in NASA Scope. And we look forward to seeing more and doing more with you in the future. Thank uh, you so very much. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone, you have a great day and we'll see you next month at our savory session, which will be what, Anna? So the next month's <clears throat> topic will be around the Bulletin of the American Astronomical Society uh, submissions. And if you want to be an editor, we still are looking for people to help out with that. It is funded, so you will get paid for your time. So you should totally join. It'll be um, at the on the last Friday of every month. So let's see. The next one will be on April. Let me pull up my calendar. April 26th at 11 so yeah Camille, we'll be Camille you should definitely join us for that one so you can share your experience definitely <laughs> all right everyone we'll see you next month thanks again bye-bye